And it's like so interesting to me that especially in these times of like coronavirus, like there's so many similarities of like what people are experiencing mm. that undocumented immigrants have been experiencing <laughs> their whole lives. Yes. I'm Mark Brand, and this is We Get Us, a real talk conversation featuring humans who are committed to making a better future for all of us. This week's guest is Samantha Ramirez, and she offers us a lens into what it feels like to be an undocumented immigrant in general and also just right now. Let me tell you, we have so much to learn from that community. Sam is a filmmaker, social justice advocate, mother, DACA recipient, don't worry, we're going to tell you what that means, amongst many other things, as well as my dear friend. Look forward to sharing. I had somebody send me a note today. Obviously, we know your mantra, you just shared it with ours, and mine's right here on my hands and stays there. Um, And they're both based really in love, right, and how we're showing up as love in the world. So in this moment, what is the word? Because it's constantly moving. What does the word love mean to you? It means like showing up for people. Mm. And I think like also like showing up for yourself. I think most importantly, right? I, I feel like love is like such like a word that we like throw around so much. But I feel like in these times, it's like showing up for yourself because it's fucking crazy and scary. Mm-hmm. And when you show up for yourself, like you have the capacity to show up for other people too. And we all need to be showing up for each other right now. Yeah. So on that note, everybody's sharing tips and tricks and they, um, a lot of them seem to be super homogenized, right? Not that they're any less important, but it's just like, there's a top three list that's floating around and it's like meditate or yoga or exercise. And you're like, yeah, all great, all super (laughs) fucking helpful. And Definitely wish we could squeeze time amongst triage into doing all of those things and working for them and also trying to prescribe them for people. But how do you show up for yourself right now in this moment? So right now for myself, it's like, I wish it was as pretty as it's like out there, like meditate, work out, stay on your routine. Like for me showing up for myself, it's like eating. Like if I feel like fucking eating. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Good. Like. You know, hanging out with my son and like making him feel safe during this Mm. time and also just like doing things that I'm really passionate about. Like I feel like extremely privileged, right? Like to be able to have like safety, like a roof over my head, like food, like all of these things that allow me to quarantine. Like we should, you know, they tell us that we should be doing like a lot of people don't have that privilege. But for me, it's like showing up for myself is being able to not necessarily feel guilty about it because I do feel guilty about it a lot. And it's like a battle I've been battling with, but saying, you know, like this is like where I'm at right now Mm -hmm. and I can show up for myself by not feeling like guilty about it and beating myself up about it, but also like making sure that I am aware of my privilege and that I'm using it to also help other people and support them in the ways that I can. I love all of that. So I want to pin a couple of things you just said. I'm going to reflect them back real quick which is um, number one, privilege and the balance of it, right? So using it, but also being aware of it. And then that's holding space for you. And then the other part is really looking after self and immediate. So it's like other over on this side and then self on this side and self also meaning your son. But before we, because you and I are just going to get into it and then go, go, I want you to um, introduce yourself the way that feels most true for you. I am a human being. Yeah, you are. (laughs) One of my favorites, I might add. (laughs) I just feel like I'm a human being, you know, like complex, multi-layered, multi-dimensional, like an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. an artist, Mm -hmm. creative, a mother, an activist. Like sometimes I hate the word activist because I feel like it's so like just someone who shows up for my community, I feel. Yo, hold on. I want to hear all <laughs> about that energy because, you know, you know I speak on this about activists being our own worst enemy sometimes, right? And what what does that mean for you? Like, where, where did that energy come from? What does that say? I just like titles. Like, I've, I've never been like a super fan of titles. Mm. Like, I just feel like very like... Sometimes you have to use them. Like if you're like presenting somewhere, you have to like, you you know, have a bio and all of the things so that people can get a gist of who you are. But I feel like, like it's just the word activist kind of to me. It's like we we just throw it around so much. And like, you know, like we use it as like 
I don't know, like a way of validating that we're doing something for others. And I feel Ooh. like sometimes what we do for others, like it's not even like some of the people that are doing so much great work out there. Like sometimes they're, they're not like on social media. They're not really sure. like calling themselves activists. They're just like really fucking showing up, like rolling up their sleeves and getting shit done. So for me, like using the word activist, I'm like, you know, like I'm more of an entrepreneur. I'm a creative and I show up for my community. Right. Mm. But I wouldn't say that I like see myself as those people who I have seen like being out there, like, you know, like doing shit that I'm like, damn, like it's like. I don't know, like they're showing up in ways that I feel like I don't feel like I'm doing enough, you know? Right. So here's this this comparison thing that always comes up amongst activism too, right? That triggers people. So it's like trying to explain to folks what makes them most comfortable right now is what's right. Yeah. Like what does that mean? Like if what if my comfort is sitting on the couch and playing uh, – Call of Duty for 10 hours. I'm like, as long as you don't do that every day, I think that's totally (laughs) fucking fine. And, you know, like whatever self-care looks like to you is important to be able to do. But you should not be in that 10 hours in this sphere of I should be doing more for my community. That's when you get up the next morning, you put some rigor to that and say, I'm going to do this or do the other thing. The people who are on the front lines doing the work need support from creatives. They need support from these conversations. They need support in all sorts of ways and nourishment. So everybody has a role to play and identifying yours without it being guilt-led is so important. Because if guilt informs it, then you always have trepidation about the way you show up. Right? You're like, am I supposed to be at this party? Is this okay for me? And what I said, um, going on a couple of years ago with our mutual dear friend, Marcus Glover, and our, our other friend, Onika Mays. Now, those two teach uh, wellness and meditation and yoga in Rikers and in prisons. And we had this panel on forgiveness. And at the end of the panel, they asked me, they said, what um, do you think our single biggest challenge is going to be for this year coming up? And I said, activists. And it was a room full of activists. And they were like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And I was like, we're our own biggest problem. Like we're one of the most exclusionary groups on the planet. And of course I was projecting it out because I wanted people to see or mirror it or lens it and be like, what do you mean? Like if you don't speak the language, the vernacular around my type of activism, I immediately exclude you, right? And then there's this other thing of, I shouldn't have to teach you how to show up fair. And so if all of these things are true, then we could never move forward. And it's like, so where do you find the soft spot in between where you're willing to give a little, take a little compassion and, and spread it, show that empathy for people who are trying to come to the work? And that's why activist triggers me, yeah. right? Because I'm like, I'm on the front lines with these folks who are like, we don't need help from the government. They're useless anyway. Everybody's useless. And I'm like, well, we're 50 years deep in this game and we're losing. Yeah. So how do we Yeah, win? that's real. That's like real. <laughs> right? How do we show up for each other? So what I, I say all of that to say, I appreciate the way that you show up as an activist, as a creative, and all of the things that you identify with, regardless of when you're identifying with them, because it, it's from truth and light and creativity. Right? So how do we approach things? And that's why we get to work together on so much fun stuff is because we both approach it with love and with trust. So it's, yeah, an honor. Um So on that, now about privilege, before we go to that, actually, let me step back because you talked about yourself in one way, but allow me to talk about you if that's okay. Can I ask permission? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. So I met Sam at a conference and she came to stage and essentially explained to a room full of very privileged people uh, what the plight of the dreamer was. And I was freaking out in the back, like essentially standing on a chair yelling and clapping (laughs) as were a bunch of the artists who were there who come from marginalized backgrounds and understand how important that message is to land. So for this first episode, what was important for me is to be able to show people how to show up, right? At that conference, on the back end of that, you were swarmed to the point of uncomfortable, right? Like you had to remove yourself because so many people wanted to put their guilt on you. Um, but it's an opportunity at the same time. So I met you there, and then we've had the great pleasure of being able to speak on a bunch of different things together um, and spend time. And so I think why I wanted to bring you to these folks is that I want you to help everybody understand what does the terminology dreamer mean? What does DACA mean? What does it feel like right now? What's it mean for people who are undocumented 
in the face of all of these existential crises. And by telling people who you are as a leader creative who's come from literally ground up, all those stories that we hear about people who had 50 bucks in a bus ticket, well, that's your actual origin story. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But you have a lens and an attachment to the people in our countries that struggle so hard. So would you be able to help us define those things and then help people understand how they can come to the work? Small ask, small ask. Yeah, for sure. So like the term dreamer, it comes from um, DACA, right? And DACA is a program that was created by the Obama administration in 2012, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And in essence, what it means is that, um, you know, there's, to start off, there's 11 million undocumented immigrants in America. Wow. And our immigration system in America, it needs work, right? There's so many systems that, you know, are flawed, but the immigration system in America has not really changed for the better and it has not evolved. And so you have 11 million people that are undocumented in America. For DACA, it was like if you were brought as a child which means that you didn't make the choice to come to America and your parents brought you to America as a child. And if you had gone to school here, had been here for, um, I forgot exactly how many years you had to, but there's like a criteria that you meet. And for people like myself who were, you know, grew up in America and, you know, I personally did not have the opportunity to go to college because I was undocumented. And back then, there was not a conversation about undocumented immigrants. It was like the secret that you have to right. like hold. And it's like so interesting to me that especially in these times of like coronavirus, like there's so many similarities of like what people are experiencing mm. that undocumented immigrants have been experiencing their whole lives. Yes. So a lot of the uncomfort that people are feeling with coronavirus I feel like a lot of us undocumented people like have lived through it, like not being able to leave the country, like having to like stay indoors and not go do fun things, um, not being able to get tested for like this, like this illness, mm -hmm. like not having like the opportunity to see your loved ones and having to FaceTime them or having to use technology to call your grandma. Those are all things that undocumented immigrants have had to live with their whole lives. So a lot of these, these uncomfortable things to us are normal. And we're mm -hmm. like, this has been our whole existence, right? And so for me, like growing up, it was a secret I had to like hold. And so when DACA came around, it was like really an opportunity to the whole like idea of like undocumented immigrants, do it the right way, get in line, um, you know, like become a citizen. DACA, in essence, was that ability to come forward and do things the quote unquote right way. Right. You have to be vetted. You have to like go and get like a background check. They like do a criminal background check on you. You cannot have any offenses or you do not like get to be in a program. You have to have graduated high school. You have to um, pay a fee. You have to pay wow. a couple fees. Right. And you get a permit and, you know, they take your fingerprints Like you go through this extreme vetting process. And you have to like prove that you've been here. Like you have to prove so many things. And after you have filed all of that and then you get an acceptance letter, what you get is a social security number and a work permit that expires every two years. So you have to go and renew your permit every two years and pay this fee and go through the vetting process all over again. So um, when that program came into play, it really like made this like group of young people like become visible mm. right and when i say visible i say it to the system yeah. to you know to our government because we've always been visible to ourselves we've always seen each other we've always honored each other we've always like seen our stories so we're visible to ourselves and to our communities but we were not visible to you know, like an employer who could give you a job and give you like an opportunity to do a job outside of service work. Like I did a lot of labor work. I did a lot of service work. I did a lot of jobs that I felt were just frankly like below my potential because I felt that I was like just as smart as everybody else in my high school. I felt like I was just as like, you know, like worthy of getting a higher education, mm -hmm. but I was not able to do it because I did not have a social security number. And 
when DACA came into play, it really opened up so many doors, not just for myself, but for around 800,000 young people who were full of dreams. And I believe the word dreamer comes from like, I don't know, them thinking that we have dreams, but I feel like (laughs) we've had more than dreams. Like we have been proactive even without like DACA, like we all like were, you know, finding ways to thrive and to help our families and to help our parents. And so with DACA, it was like it opened up so many doors of opportunity. I was able to get a driver's license, something that I had never been able to have. Right. It's like the little things that we take for granted, like being able to drive and not have to pull out a passport or go to a club with some friends and be able to like show my like license and not be embarrassed (laughs) because my friends are like, why the fuck do you have a passport? Right. 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 So all of these different things that it opened up for us. And so this DACA program has been under attack for the past almost four years by the current administration. And it's been like going back and forth to like the courts. It's like we just had a hearing at the Supreme Court in November and the Supreme Court is supposed to be making a final decision on the program because the current administration um, has been suing to end the program. Right. Which is fucking crazy. Literally. Because you tell people to do it the right way. And when people are signing up, showing up and doing the right thing, you're still like penalized and you're still like made to feel that you are not worthy. There it is. I've got like the, my frontal lobe is burning. Because uh, you and I have had this discussion so many times, and I know that I'm just listening to what's showing up in my body every time we talk about it, and there's a want for action, right? It's like, well, Mm -hmm. we're doing stuff all the time. We're trying to make all of those systems change by showing up, but it requires the masses to show up. It really requires everybody to be part of a democratic experience and like get to the polls and vote. And so you, as a hardcore advocate, not activist um, for this, obviously not just from personal experience, but from your community and all the people around you, the idea that the disparity exists if two folks in New Jersey have a baby, that baby never has to be fingerprinted or go through any of these things. But if two people who've come here and worked really hard do, but the nationality is different, the rigor is different, it's police state, is obscene. So what do you want folks to engage in? Like, is it municipally, statewide, federally? What do we have to do in these coming months to make sure that this program stays safe, that the rest of the things, when you say insanity, I mean, both of us probably had this laundry list of things. Like, where does where do we start and end in the last four years? Every single day is another um, attack on people's freedoms. So what do people need to do to be able to show up? Well, I think it's like super important to like, I know that like every community is under attack right now, right? Like everybody is being impacted by this crisis in more than one way, right? And it's like right now, like the most important thing to do is for the Supreme Court to delay their decision on DACA. When you think about like how many like healthcare workers are a part of this DACA program, there's like close to 30,000 healthcare workers, nurses, researchers, pharmacists, like doctors, there's DACA recipients who are doctors. So you have like this like huge number of people who, if this decision is made by the Supreme Court, it will like really impact like the people that are showing up for America, right? And it's important that like as people, the way that we can show up for our immigrant communities right now is to call our state reps to continue calling like every day. We have the time now. We're at home, right? Right. Like the ones that are able to be at home, like call your state reps and ask for protections for immigrants and not just for DACA. Like when you think about family separation also, right? I feel like as immigrants, as a DACA recipient, I feel so fucking privileged that sometimes it feels like bad to ask people to think about our situation right now. When I'm seeing like our undocumented communities like so like under attack right now. Mm-hmm. You think about undocumented immigrants in America. Undocumented immigrants pay 7 to $11 billion of taxes every year. So the whole narrative of like, you know, you're coming here, you're not paying taxes, you're doing this. Like the negative narrative about Im- undocumented immigrants is so false, right? And it's also like... These are people that are not just showing up to ask for things for handouts. Like, I don't 
think I've ever met an undocumented immigrant that was asking for a handout. And that's from my personal experience. Same. What I have seen is like people like finding a way. And so it's important that as we're calling our state reps that we're asking for comprehensive immigration reform for all undocumented immigrants and to keep the DACA like program in place. And when we ask like our reps, you know, it's like protection for immigrants. Like we're human too. Mm-hmm. The fact that we have to state that like we're human too is like crazy, right? Like it's fucking crazy. When I talk to other friends and I'm like, what do we want? They're like, we want to be humanized. We want to be seen as human. And I'm like, that's fucking crazy that we have to ask right. people to see us as a human being. And I think that it's important to show up to the polls, to show up, you know, to make sure that if we have the privilege or if like others have the privilege, I can't vote. But if others have the fr- privilege to vote, to vote, to continue like calling state reps, like to continue like pushing for like immigration reform that would impact DACA recipients that would help like our program expand and allow for people to file for citizenship and to allow others to also have a pathway to do it the right way. Absolutely. So I want to bring up normative behaviors here. And then I also want to just say that on the back end of this, that we will put together a resource of every single state and state rep who can be contacted and all the ways that they can be contacted during this time. And we'll make sure to get that out to every single person who is aware of this and we'll make sure it goes far and wide. But the normative behavior is what makes it difficult for people to advocate as humans, as one-on-one. You're at a party, you say, hey, this is important to me and somebody spits those false tropes, right? They're like, oh yeah, well, immigrants are a drain on the system or A, B, and C. To be able to say, well, actually last year they contributed $11.6 billion into taxes, which they'll never see any of the benefit from. And 30,000 of them are service workers. Another 12,000 are caregivers. Another four and a half million are service workers who keep our restaurants running, who are now completely unemployed. And actual numbers that people can then say, this is the truth. Because I don't think people have access to the truth. I think we're often surprised that there isn't any way to access this information. And that's one of the purposes of this podcast is to say, let me bring you this information from the horse's mouth so you can then have a look at it and then pull these resources so you can then act. Like, what do you do when you act, right? So we always talk about this from stage. Our job is to convey messaging and storytelling to help motivate and move people to action. But we can't move them to action unless they understand what action they're taking. Right. right? Just be like, be a better person. You're like, fuck, I get it. Like, (laughs) totally. But then what? And you're like, make a sandwich and hand it out? Like, no, definitely not. That's not the thing. I mean, if you want to, sure. uh, Just preferences are important and agency is important. But what does it look like to show up? And I think we have to stop having this fucking conversation about I volunteer here or there and the other place. We appreciate you. Better Life Foundation appreciates you. We love all of that. But what you need to do is change the system now because we're watching the system fail in real time. And back to your point, Everybody is getting to have a little bit of the human experience that all marginalized populations feel. And there's this incredible disparity of privilege now with folks saying, hey, I can't believe I have to stay inside. And I'm like, what a luxury. Right. I I don't want you to feel fucked up because I'm sure you have mental (laughs) health issues too. And like, this isn't great. And like, isolation sucks. It's the biggest cause of addiction and instability. But there's literally tens of millions of people around the planet who don't have running water and can't escape this where they're right next to each other right now. So what are you going to do in this time? And I think a good use of your time is education and getting educated about the issues and how you can show up and then banging those doors, right? It's still, it's going to be fall before we see our way through this particular part. At the earliest, the elections are right there. So we got to work. We got to work. (laughs) All right. So other things that we're going to talk about today... Love was one of them. We're going to come back to that. We're not letting that one go just yet. I really appreciate you sharing about what the dreamer experiences like pragmatically um, and more on a systems level. But I would love you to tell people your story because I tell it all the time. um, (laughs) But I would love to hear it from from you. Wow, that's like such like a loaded thing, right? Like this is a fucking like 
million page book already. <laughs> I've seen you do it in four minutes. I've seen you do it in 28 and make people fucking cry. I've seen like all kinds of variations. So think about this in the, the setting that we're in right now. The majority of people who are listening have never met you. They don't know why this is important to you, right? And so what is the story? Like, where where do you come from? Like, w- really, like, where does the advocate come from? Not a physical place, but where does this passion and love and burning need to create and inspire others, where does that derive from? So really, I feel like when I think about like just my story and every single experience that has brought me to this point, there's a lot of pain, right? And I feel like pain is something that I've learned that is beautiful in so many ways right it's like alchemy I feel like I'm an alchemist like being able to transform all of these like challenges that I experienced from a young age not just as an undocumented immigrant right but just like as a woman as a young girl as a Latina like as a single mother right but it's like you know I came to America when I was six uh two months away from my seventh birthday you know came through the border with my family, really left everything behind and came to America and started like literally like with like the clothes on our back. And we shared a home with like other undocumented um, families. And like all I saw my whole life was a lot of like hard work from my parents, but also like the other side to that was like the trauma that our parents carry. Um, you know, the way that they didn't receive love, again, like the word love, the way that they didn't receive love, the way that they knew how to show love, the way that they knew how to show discipline, the way that they felt they had to um, teach us how to be strong, quote unquote, right? And it's just like growing up, it was like so many different experiences, experiences, right? Layered, like learning a new language, like learning how to like survive in the neighborhood because there's like other kids who think you're crazy and weird and learning how to survive at home with like other siblings who are all like in the same like position of like I like exploring identity, like navigating like our parents' trauma, navigating like a new country, navigating like all of these different things, right? And so like you normalize a lot of things growing up. And that was my experience. I normalized a lot of like toxic and negative things in my life. And I felt like that was like the way, right? And we really like grew up seeing like a lot of hard work again. Like I felt like sacrifice was definitely like my father's love language, like sacrifice. Like, you know, we never really heard the word love in our home. Like my mother would never say, I love you. I'm proud of you. My father would never say those words. For them, it was like just show up, work, you know, like. My dad, like, loved making Mexican candy. That was, like, what we did. As soon as we were able to get our small home, which didn't even have a bathroom finished, we used to have to shower outside with a hose, like, in this empty pool. Like, you know, like, just growing up, I just saw so many things that even though they were really hard, like, my escape has always been, like, my creativity, my mind, And talking to myself, like, I am a loner, like, by choice. Like, I love being alone. Of course, you know, there's times where I show up, I'll hang out with my community, but I I prefer solitude because that's the time when I really get to learn, like, about myself. And when I learn about myself, I really give, it gives me an ability to learn about other things outside of myself. And as long as I feel like I am in tune with myself and my spirit, I feel like I could be the best alchemist that I can be in any situation and the way that I could inspire others to also like dig deep into their truth and Mm -hmm. to live their truth. Right. And so for me, just like growing up and just like experiencing all those different things, like made me feel like I never want anyone to feel this pain. I never want anyone to feel like they just don't belong. I never want anyone to feel like their wings are clipped, right? Like, I never want anyone, like, just, like, being a teenager and being undocumented and, like, feeling like I was never going to be able to tap into my potential because I couldn't 
you know, go to school or because I couldn't do the things that other people were doing, like drive a car because I didn't have a license, because my parents couldn't afford to buy me nice clothes, because I had to go to work at a pizza shop at 14 and help pay bills. Like all of these things made me feel very sad and depressed. And it made me feel like I just couldn't live my dreams ever. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel like, wow, I have to get out of here one day. And so like all of those feelings of like, just like deep pain and a deep longing to be able to spread my wings and fly one day where what made me like promise to myself, like, you know, when, when I make it, because I always had a knowing that I would like escape this environment and fly and like do all of these things that I dreamed of. I was like, when I make it, I'm going to make sure that I make others feel that they too can touch the sky. Mm -hmm. Right. I want others to feel like they belong. I want others to feel like they too can be seen and that they too have this power. If I was able to like make it out of all of these different like experiences that I had growing up, I feel that we all can tap into that power and really, really like find ourselves, you know, and like made a lot of choices like. I got married, then I got divorced, and I had a son, and I moved to Atlanta by myself, literally with like the $50. I was renting a room in an unsafe place that I found on like Craigslist. Like I did all of these things, but it was not necessarily like being reckless. It was like, that is what I had to work with. Sure. Right? Like I didn't have a safety net. I couldn't call my parents and say, hey, I need help or Hey, can y'all help me like find a place? I didn't even have a social security number. I didn't have like a work permit. Like I just had myself in this power that I felt inside of myself to be able to overcome. And the immigrant way has always been like, if there is no way, you make a way, right? Like creativity is like a skill that I feel like we just carry naturally because of the challenges that we overcome. We are made to have to think in like think in an innovative way like okay if I can't do it this way what way can I do it I always like say that like immigrants are like the original hackers like we know how to hack a system we know how to make something work like you just like grow up with this like ability to if there is no way I'm gonna find a way it's kind of like sticking a fork in the back of a tv right you don't have an antenna you're gonna find something that works And so I, you know, I moved to Georgia and just like did a ton of like work from passing out flyers and street corners for party promoters and being a hookah girl. And like, I remember one time I was working for this club promoter and passing out flyers and young Jeezy pulled up in his car and I was like, here, sir, you want to come to this party? I didn't know who he was then. And he was like, what? I'm young Jeezy. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm trying to make my money. (laughs) Jeezy was like, you don't know me. The streets know me. You need to know me. (laughs) So, you know, I did all of these jobs and stuff. And I just became really passionate about storytelling. And like I started a YouTube channel called the Sam Off the Record Experience with this flip cam. Somebody loaned me. I just learned how to make videos online, like how to download Adobe Premiere, how to do this, how to do that. And I just like started teaching myself how to make videos. Like you just like fast forward and like I'm an entrepreneur now. I have like a creative agency. Shout out to my team that's still working from home, like called Off the Record. And now we are like working with like super dope like people like Gloria Steinem, like, you know, like just like doing like great social justice focus, like storytelling. And it's fucking beautiful like to have a home like for me to have a home after like couch surfing living with like undocumented families having tons of roommates or renting rooms for from craigslist like to have a home is like something that i value so much because i never had that right and so like being in this place now like i take so much pride in like my home and like you know like being able to give my son a safe space during this time. Like it's a blessing that I'm like, I don't take it for granted, but it's something that I feel that we all deserve. Right. And what you just (laughs) encapsulated there, it's just every time you say it, 
I'm like, if that's not the fucking American dream, I don't know what is. Like, if that's not the actual roadmap to it, right? By any means necessary, hustle, stay true to self, look after family, work hard. It pays off. It provides you safety and security in a community and a family. That's it. But you had to do it literally with zero resource, no access to the systems that have been provided to create the American dream and still made it into this place that's so far beyond measures of success. So I'm just, I'm just always so proud of you. <laughs> Every time we have this conversation, I'm like, and then what happens? And I was like, <laughs> well, then what happens? I'm like, I already know what happens, but I'm just excited for people to have a look, right? And this isn't to reflect on somebody who's gone through real adversity and made it is not to make you feel bad about yourself for not working harder, not trying harder. This is the opportunity now to be like, yo, this is possible. Everything that we're fed from media, from everything that we look at is that it's not. And it truly is possible. This isn't like motivational discussion. It's just whatever you decide is. And you just have to be committed to the the time that it takes to be that and do that. But there's a couple of things that you touched on that really hit me uh, that I haven't heard you say this way before. So I want to go back to them. Um, And the one was normalizing toxicity and that your dad, that sacrifice was his love language. Bars. Bars sacrifice was my <laughs> father's love language is the name of a fucking four page like <laughs> essay or just poem right now about what that looks like can you say more yeah um so my my grandfather was a farm worker and he i don't even know how many siblings my dad has might be 11 i don't know how many it is right because i don't have a lot of um connect like connection or relationship with my family um in mexico So my grandfather was a farmer and my dad grew up, you know, very poor in Oaxaca, like little town. He didn't even have shoes, didn't get an education past sixth grade. My grandfather would come to America and work in the farm fields and then be sent back to Mexico and just like came back and forth. So my father's example of what a father is, um, you know, like it just he didn't really have that. He didn't really have like a roadmap or he didn't have anybody like showing him love, like in the way that, you know, like we, we see parents that are like the exemplary parents, like giving love. So my mother and him married very young. My mother was 14. She also didn't get an education past sixth grade. And I, you know, you just like realize that there's a lot of trauma in a lot of our families and then you have like machismo right like which is like heavy misogyny like I feel like it's so important that as we celebrate our culture and our roots and all of that that we also you know critique it and that we call it out when it's there because Mm -hmm. it's like I could love it but I also have to point out things that need work right and misogyny and machismo is a very big thing so my father was a very angry person when we came to America right like he was angry I guess because of the way the systems were set up or because maybe he just felt the stress of having this family and having to like prove his humanity and his country and have to provide. And, you know, like he just never really had like the love that as as a child you crave, right? And so we did grow up in a toxic home well, where there was violence sometimes. Mm-hmm. And you kind of grow up thinking that this is normal. Right. And it just like trickles down where it impacts also like your other siblings, right? Like we just just grew up in a home that was very toxic. And I'm like, maybe one day I will like dig deeper into that part of my life. Mm-hmm. But it was it was a dark place and it was a like I realized now, like after years of like I had an estranged relationship with my family for about six years until like, you know, my dad needed help. And then he started moving here. Then my siblings moved here. And just recently, my mother moved here, too, who I had not had a relationship with, with like for over eight years. But it's like we grow up normalizing something sometimes and we don't realize that 
they're toxic until we remove ourselves from them. Mm -hmm. And for me, like coming to Atlanta by myself, um, just like knowing that I had to make my own path and that I was ready to become a new person and heal myself as like a mother that now had a child, that I did not want him to be stuck in these like repetitive cycles, that I wanted us to just grow from, you know, from the things that we had lived through. It was like removing myself that let me like really realize like, wow, like love is so many other things that I have not seen or experienced, right? Mm -hmm. But it is something that I can give to myself. And it is something that I can learn how to like undo toxic cycles and just like focus on really like just like creating my own idea of that. But first and foremost, like to myself. Mm -hmm. So I have dedicated, like, since I moved here to Atlanta, to like breaking cycles and teaching my family a new way of living, teach them a new way of loving, teach them a new way of healing, and teach them a new way of building a path forward. It's super beautiful, Sam. Oh, it was um, really coming up the whole time that you were saying that is. Uh, the courage that it took to do what you had to do pragmatically pales in comparison to the courage it takes to break generational trauma, right? To be able to face it and to call out what, what was in a loving and gentle way that there's space for others to be in it versus an yeah. accusatory way, right? Which is the way that we, we get taught in trauma as it comes through. You're like, you have to face the person that abused you or that and say those things you're like i is there another way and yes there is yeah. another way by example by living yeah. by showing them how to live it because certain things there's there's no amount of apology via voice that can ever heal yeah but by living in a better way and being supportive now versus behind is a, a really a testament to what what love means right yeah. And it's a journey, you know, Fuck like it's yeah, a it journey. Is. Like, is there times where I'm still like mad or angry or like, like processing like all of these fucking messy and complicated feelings that come with being human? Yes. <laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. Like, I'm very aware. And that's when like the whole like solitude and really like being like going inside right like i've seen this like graphic going around that's like if you can't go outside go inside mm -hmm. i'm like i've been living that life right <laughs> like right? experiencing these like feelings and saying you know what like there's still a lot of work that i have to do Definitely. as a human being Definitely. and so many cycles that i have to continue like breaking not just like not just like the economic cycles right there's so many cycles to break but I know that as I'm breaking those cycles from emotional to financial to like first in my family to do this, first in my family to do that, like helping my family, right? It's like so much work. But on top of that, it's still the work of like emotions and healing and trauma and all of that that has to happen. Definitely. You know, it's interesting part about um, those cycles of healing going back generations as you start to peel back. You find somebody often in your lineage or in your heritage that you really admire, right? That you, if you're able to tap back that far and you say, oh, my grandfather actually had it figured out and this is what he lived through and how he went about his life. And the stories that we uncover are so, so like multifaceted, but it lives in us. It's in us. Right? So we feel these things. When I first came to Vancouver, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. I'm not from here. I grew up in the Maritimes, but I was born in Scotland and I moved around a lot. And the Maritimes would, I guess, be my, my formative years home. But when I came to Vancouver and to the downtown east side where I operate, I was like, this is my place. And I felt it in my fucking bones. I was like, why? And so I was like, because all the artists are here, because all the musicians are here, the creatives are here, opportunity is here. So I set up all my businesses here, right? And at one point, we were over 500 employees in these blocks and built this thing. But it wasn't that. Like, I was like, this isn't, this is fulfilling. But no, 
when I started doing work specifically around people who are marginalized and trying to change those systems and providing everything in that same fiber and that same exact energy was like, this is it. And I'm not a religious person, but I'm deeply spiritual. I was like, I wonder what that is. So when my grandfather passed away, we went to my uncle, my dad, my aunt, and I went to go through all of his stuff and like figure out because we had to downsize the house and get things sorted out. And I found this suitcase and it was like a fucking movie. We opened up the suitcase and there was all these letters in it and all of these different like postcards. And I was like, who are these people? And I'm asking my uncle and my dad. And they're like, we've never seen any of this because my, my grandfather was like, a hug on your birthday at Christmas, but not an emotional guy, like zero emotion. Yeah. And there was these letters from his dad, my great grandfather. And my great grandfather turns out was an abortion doctor, seven blocks from Save On Meats in Vancouver, who got arrested from it, like beaten incessantly, ended up being mentally ill and dying in a mental institution here in Vancouver, like on these blocks. So I'd already been working in these blocks and doing this work very similar work for those who don't have a voice, but didn't know. And it lived within me. So I can look back now and identify in my own lineage, like, oh, fuck, thank God. Like, this makes sense. And people are like, yeah, that's just you. Maybe that's your story. Um, No, (laughs) it's everybody's fucking story. We just got to look back and figure out what it is because you can feel it. I'm like, why do I get so triggered by people being disrespectful around mental health? Oh, (laughs) And all of these things that happen for us. So I really appreciate you sharing. And more importantly, I'm just modeling what it looks like. Because regardless of where you come from, you have this story in your family. There's something about it. And so helping people understand what they can do positively on self, we started in another place, allows them to be solid enough in their own convictions to then start to take action for other. So thank you for covering all of that. We went from what's love mean to (laughs) self-love to this is how I show love, period. Um, And I think I just want to ask you one more thing. uh, And that is, what are you most excited about that has presented itself as an opportunity in this moment of existential crisis that we're facing? (sighs) Honestly, it feels... It feels strange to be living through this time and at the same time feeling this peace that I'm feeling because I know that not everybody is like, you know, not everybody is in like, has like the privilege that we have or like the ability to like be living through a peaceful time right now. For me, I feel this like strange peace, but it's like something that I feel like I developed a long time ago when like challenges would come, like I wouldn't panic I would just like feel like I'm going to get through this. And it's it's, it's a weird feeling that I can't describe, but I, maybe it was just like a way of like just protecting myself or mm-hmm. something. But I, I'm excited about transformation. Yeah. I feel that in the midst of like one thing that I've learned is that destruction comes before new creation. Mm-hmm. And I feel that even though times are really dark and scary and even though everything is unknown in so many ways, I just have this feeling that something new is coming. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what it looks like. But I know that there's a transformation happening. And it that's exciting to me. Mm-hmm. Knowing that there's like an opportunity to write a new page. And I have not come to to find what that looks like for me, like in my business. Like, of course, I want to keep it moving. You know, of course, there's projects that I'm excited about. But I feel like as a human being, like I'm growing in a way that I can't describe yet because we're still in the midst of it. But just like tapping into my spirit, having that time to really like tap into like this power again that's within us and ask these new questions and say, who am I going to be after this? It's what's really exciting for me. Because once I become a new version of myself, everything around me becomes a new version of whatever it is that I'm working on. So I can't just like pin it down to one thing. Mm -hmm. I am excited about transformation. I am excited about this awakening that is happening around the world because as we are seeing all of this play out, we are all becoming aware of what 
systems are are failing us. Like it's not just like as marginalized people, we've seen it, we've known it, but it's like now the whole world is really seeing it because everybody's like impacted by it. Yeah. And it's like, what will we do with that awareness? What will we do with this massive awakening? Like I've already had conversations with people who are like, man, when I come out of this, like I want to be more conscious about this. I want to be more conscious about the world. I want to be more conscious about nature. I want to be more conscious about like the clothes I buy. Like this awakening and these conversations that are happening are so important because they're going to shape what the world looks like when we come out of this, if we come out of this, right? And what the world will look like for my son, for my grandkids, for like our future generations. So I'm excited about this awakening and this transformation that we're going through. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really excited that you got to share some ways that we can go about doing that today. Because I think it is this feeling that we're in now, but like many feelings, it will pass if some sort of normalcy comes back unless we act in this moment. Yeah. We have the opportunity to act now. We have to act now, right? I had this just as a, an analogy. I had this moment yesterday where I got a note from somebody saying, did you know that you can get produce delivered right to your door? And I was like, I was aware of <laughs> these CSA boxes as they're commonly known. And they were like, community <laughs> support of agriculture is really cool. I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. This is like a 1%, 1% thing, right? The farmer's market, whereas the people who are servicing it are generally coming from a different place. But to understand we have an opportunity to embrace local agriculture right now is just one of the hundreds of things. It's like, you can't go anywhere. Your farmer can't wait to hook you up with mushroom season, with all of the stuff that's happening in the spring and summer season when we're going to be under these issues. I think that's just one thing that we point to as somebody who's battled for food systems for 20 plus years. I'm like, yo, this is a moment where we might not need to ship things in containers all the way around the world that lettuce actually grows here too and how to approach different systems. And just as like an analogy of an awakening of the things that were always possible, were always possible. We're just being forced into being, bringing them into our awareness and coming out of this, what has felt like a societal auto loop of the capitalism created for us. It's like, you chase this, you do this, and we've been guilty of it too, right? It's like, okay, I'm on the road 290 days a year. Is that necessary? Yeah. Is that necessary? <laughs> like, oh, you and I, I'm in the comfort of my apartment, which I was in exactly three and a half weeks last year, having this conversation with you which we would have saved for in person, which would have done us both a disservice. And now we get to share it with everybody. Like we're all having awakenings in this moment, not just the people who didn't understand systemic oppression, but also like, how are we looking after self? What's possible? I got a board meeting next week just this way that I'm excited about, (laughs) right? Because I don't have to worry about anybody being late. (laughs) <laughs> Y'all better show up on time. Um, thank you so much for... Sp- and that's like one thing I just want to say. Like, I love watching your stories. Like, I learned so much. Like, one thing I didn't do before was cook a lot. And now I'm like cooking every day. And I'm yes. like, oh my God. Like, your story is so inspiring to me. Like, everything about it. Like, you know, like when you were talking about the like local like veggies and stuff. When you went to Chinatown and you were buying all that stuff. I was like, damn, like... We didn't think about, well, I didn't think about it until I watched your story. So I'm grateful for you for sure. So I appreciate that reflection and I'm learning how to take compliments better. So this is a moment where I'm going to let that land. And You're I'm, badass. <laughs> I fucking love you. <laughs> I'm going to let it land also because it's awakened me to things that are my responsibility that aren't systemic learnings. I don't have to be teaching about design thinking and like, this is how we end homelessness every day. I can teach you about my really good friend, Yen, who runs the butcher shop here for the last 60, 70 years. And it's equally as important because people need to see themselves in the work in a pragmatic way. That's what this whole podcast system of We Get Us is about because we really do get us and we need to stop overcomplicating things. So thank you. Thank you for coming through. Thank you. It's such an honor and a pleasure to spend time with you as always. Give that gorgeous son of yours a huge high five from me. And um, we'll talk really soon. All right, Mark. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sam.